Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and we're here today to consider six pieces of legislation related to vacant properties and buildings and the underutilization of those pro these properties and buildings throughout the city. At the two previous hearings on vacant properties in 14 and 16, we discussed several subjects related to vacant properties, including where these properties are lo located, how these properties can be tracked, and what can be done with them. As a result of the most recent hearing, we enacted Local Laws 29 and 30 of 2018. Local Law 29 requires the city to conduct a citywide census of vacant properties, while Local Law 30 requires the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to report on vacant lots within its jurisdiction. These laws can help us better understand the scope of vacant properties. Still, more can be done. Vacant properties are troublesome for our communities. They bring down property values, may attract crime or create public health hazards. Um, there are properties that can be used to serve our communities either as housing for low-income families, as community gardens, or as playgrounds. Intro number 835, of which I'm the sponsor, will require the city to catalog and report biannually on the number and location of vacant or abandoned properties in each council district. This would give the council a greater understanding of the number of vacant properties so that we can better comprehend the scope of, these, of this problem. Similarly, intro 226, sponsored by Council Member Rose, will create a vacant property registry that will require real property owners to annually register properties that have been vacant for more than one year. Intros number 1128, 1124, and 1125, sponsored by Council Member Holden, attempt to protect the public from hazards caused by vacant properties or properties at risk of becoming vacant. Intro 1228 would ensure the safety of those near stalled construction sites by requiring that chain link fences replace wooden fences once construction has been stalled for two years. Intro number 1124 will require the Commissioner of the Department of Buildings to seal, secure, and close certain vacant properties. Intro number 1125 requires the Department of HPD to report to the Council on properties subject to foreclosure proceedings in each Council member's district. These properties pose a risk of becoming vacant. Intro number seven, sponsored by Council Member Barron, would permit the city to better understand the scope of existing affordable housing crisis by requiring HPD to report annually on the number of dwellings citywide. This information is critical for understanding the scope of the existing housing stock within the city. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members present today, council members both Chin and uh, Gredenchik, and acknowledge, uh, oh, there's no other council members. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to remind people, if you'd like to um, testify today, please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for all public testimony, and now we'll admit an oath administer the oath of, administra of administration before the testimony. Right hands up. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Great. I'm actually waiting for the day where somebody will say no. <laughs> Not today, though. Not today. All right. Please begin testimony. Good morning, Chairman Cornegy and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Joshua Sittis, and I am a senior advisor at the Mayor's Office of Operations. At Operations, we are dedicated to making New York City government as effective and efficient as possible through project and performance management, data analysis, and research. We are also the lead agency on the implementation of Local Law 29 of 2018, which I will speak about in my testimony. I am joined today by Sarah Mallory, Chief of Staff for Government Affairs at the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, and Patrick A. Whaley, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs at the Department of Buildings. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Local Law 29 of 2018 requires the city to, within three years, create a census of the number of vacant, uh, of vacant buildings and vacant lots located in residential areas, with new analysis on such areas required every five years thereafter. As there is no single source of this data in New York City, particularly for privately owned properties, operations and the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics are in the process of developing a model that integrates various data sources as indicators and predicts the likelihood that a property may be vacant. The relative weights of these indicators will be determined and refined based on a rigorous sampling methodology and visual inspections. This census is the result of of the Housing Not Warehousing Act and has the goal of identifying opportunities for housing and development. On January 8, 2018, Local Law 29 was signed into law. 
That same month, on January 26th, Operations and MODA convened a working group of relevant agencies, relevant city agencies, to evaluate the data landscape, discuss methodology, and agree on common working definitions. All agencies have provided data extracts, and MOUs were brokered for any data sets that may have contained potentially identifying information. Currently, Operations is in year one of the three-year project to create the vacant properties list and census. Later this year, we plan to continue to engage the City Council and advocates to review the sampling methodology and develop a comprehensive visual inspection survey that improves the predictive accuracy of the model. Additionally today, Operations would like to take the opportunity to speak about Intro 835, which relates closely to the implementation of Local Law 29 of 2018. We agree with the spirit of this bill and believe that the type of information being sought is the type of information Local Law 29 already requires. We are, however, concerned that the structure, of int uh, the structure of Intro 835, as currently written, would create conflict with the city's obligation under Local Law 29. Recognizing the absence of comprehensive data on the number of vacant properties and lots in our city, and the need to create a new methodology for conducting a rigorous review, the Council laid out a staged approach to designing and implementing the vacant property census. Local Law 29 requires operations to conduct the first census within three years of enactment by spring of 2021. The law calls for the census to then be recompleted every five years thereafter. Intro 835's, bi Intro 835's biennial reporting frequency would fall out of sync with the Council's existing implementation timeline. We are concerned that these inconsistent reporting cycles would impede our ability to effectively fulfill our existing mandate under Local Law 29. The vacant property census, as mandated by Local Law 29, also has a specific geographic focus. The law focuses on those areas zoned for residential usage and excludes any coastal flood zones. Intro 835, by contrast, appears to include all areas within the boundaries of NYC's five boroughs, regardless of zoning and coastal flood areas. We would welcome further conversations with the Council about the goals of 835, uh, Intro 835 and believe we can reach a solution. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to continuing the conversation and answering any questions you may have. Uh, I'd just like to say we've been joined by Councilmember Barron. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Sarah Mallory, and I am the Chief of Staff for Government Affairs at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the invitation to testify on the unprecedented steps HPD is taking to utilize vacant sites for affordable housing development in introductions 7, 226, and 1125. We firmly believe that all New Yorkers should have access to safe, quality, affordable housing, and that all the city's neighborhoods should be thriving, inclusive places of opportunity. This is why this administration has invested significant resources in creating and preserving affordable housing as part of a broader strategy that includes robust measures to prevent displacement, protect tenants from harassment, and revitalize neighborhoods that have faced decades of disinvestment. Our work around vacant lots plays a key role in this holistic approach by developing affordable housing where appropriate and working with our government partners to ensure safe conditions exist until those properties can be repurposed. HPD also recognizes the importance of financially responsible homeownership for the stability of families and neighborhoods. We appreciate Chairman Carnegie's advocacy of affordable homeownership and agree that it is a critical tool to help low and moderate income New Yorkers secure housing stability and grow equity that can be passed along to future generations. That is why we are proud to say that since the beginning of Housing New York on January 1, 2014, we have financed nearly 23,000 affordable homeownership opportunities across the five boroughs. Our revised housing plan announced new homeownership programs including Open Door, a program to finance the construction of co-ops and condos for households earning between approximately $69,000 to $112,000, which is 80% to 130% AMI for a family of three, and HomeFix, a modernized program that will provide home repair loans and other financial assistance and counseling for low to middle income homeowners. Over the years, HPD has developed a comprehensive suite of programs to support homeowners, create more homeownership opportunities, and intervene to address properties that are physically and financially distressed. The Zombie Homes Initiative has allowed increased direct outreach to families in foreclosure and the development of targeted plans to secure abandoned homes. Through the Innovative Community Restoration Fund program, HPD has purchased 62 distressed Federal Housing Administration and Federal National Mortgage Association notes for one to four family homes, 
containing a total of 95 residential units in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and on Staten Island. With Councilmember Rafael Espinal in the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, we have launched a new homeowner help desk in East New York and continue to support CNYCN in providing financial counseling and support for lower income homeowners across the five boroughs. We are providing down payment assistance to first time low income homeowners from the South Shore of Staten Island to Borough Park, Brooklyn, and Flushing, Queens. We are collaborating with NYCHA to rehab and create affordable home ownership in homes that have been foreclosed by HUD and managed by NYCHA through the NYCHA Small Homes Program. We are extending affordability and rehabilitating large Michelama co-ops like Strikers Bay and Clayton Apartments. We worked with DEP to offer regulated affordable properties a water rebate of $250 per unit. We are seeing more interest by existing cooperatives in our preservation financing programs, including Green Housing Preservation Program, which provides low or no interest smalls for small and mid-sized building owners to make environment-friendly upgrades to their homes. We are creating new low to moderate income cooperatives through the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. We are preserving permanent affordability for the community by establishing parameters for the sale, resale, and inheritance of restricted housing and inclusionary housing. We are always interested in joining council members to sponsor homeownership events with our mobile van in your district. We have already done events specific to homeownership with Chair Carnegie, Councilmember Espinal, and others. Further, HPD has left no stone unturned in our effort to pursue the development of affordable housing on both public and privately owned sites. Of the roughly 900 vacant lots under HPD jurisdiction, more than 60% of them have been designated for development or have active requests for proposals and requests for qualifications underway. We have accelerated our RFP pipeline to release RFPs at a faster clip than ever before, which has been essential in creating a 112% increase in lots program for future affordable housing development. This and additional information on HPD owned vacant lots through November 1st, 2018 can be found on our website and our local law 30 report, HPD's vacant tax lots and vacant buildings. Early in this administration, HPD launched the new infill home ownership opportunities program and neighborhood construction program. RFQ, which assembles scattered lots spread across neighborhoods into single development clusters as a way to increase the feasibility of these small and traditionally difficult to develop lots. We are proud to also recently announce our partnership with the American Institute of Architects New York to launch Big Ideas for Small Lots NYC, a design competition for housing on small city-owned vacant lots. Through the competition, we are looking to promote excellence in urban infill design, explore innovative design, and construction approaches that inform affordable small homes development and unlock difficult to develop lots. This design contest will launch next month and we are encouraged that already more than 800 architects and others have expressed interest through our website at nyc.gov slash small lots. With all this in mind, I will now turn to the bills on today's agenda. HPD is committed to transparency and reports extensive data sets on open data. We therefore support intro seven and intro 1125 with slight amendments to better align with HPD internal processes, and ensure the privacy of individuals is protected. And although we support the intent of intro 226, we do not believe it will be effectual at achieving these goals. Self-reporting by owners who might have already abandoned their property poses data quality concerns and is also incredibly difficult to enforce. Instead, we believe local law 29 more appropriately utilizes our resources and will result in unprecedented data collected by the city on vacant lots. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Good morning, Chair Carnegie, members of the Housing and Buildings Committee and the Council. I'm Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to offer testimony on two of the bills before the committee today. Introductory number 1124 would require the department to com commence proceedings to seal, secure, and close a vacant property where $25,000 or more in unpaid fines, civil penalties, or judgments is owed to the city with respect to such property. The department already has the authority to order a building to be sealed, secured, and closed when, where such a building is unsafe. Indeed, the department regularly exercises authority to commence proceedings seeking to seal, secure, and close a vacant building. Mandating vacant buildings be sealed, secured, and closed solely based on the criteria proposed in this bill, namely based on debt owed to the city, removes the department's discretion to take into consideration other significant factors, including whether the building is unsafe. The department questions the rationale to have debt to the city be the sole criteria for sealing a vacant building, particularly given that doing so may prolong vacancy for tenants in certain instances. It should also be noted that it is difficult for the department to ascertain whether a building is vacant. 
Local Law 29 of 2018, which has been discussed previously, requires the city to conduct a census of vacant properties by 2021. The mayor's office and at least a dozen agencies, including the buildings department, are working hard to estimate the number of vacant properties in the city. This analysis has yet to be completed, thus it is unclear how many buildings would be subject to this requirement. For the aforementioned reasons, the department is not supportive of this bill and welcomes the opportunity to discuss it further with the council and its sponsor. Introductory number 1128 would require that chain link fences be installed at construction sites that have been stalled for two years or longer. A construction fence is required by the New York City Building Code to enclose the construction site of a new building, areas of demolition, open excavation, or extensive alteration. Construction fences are required to be built solid for their entire length, out of wood, or other suitable materials. However, the department may approve chain link fences in certain instances, including for sites where work has been interrupted or abandoned and discontinued. The department supports requiring chain link fences at stalled sites with the understanding that the onus should be on the property owner to install a chain link fence if work is stalled, given that they are in the best position to determine whether, has, whether work has stopped for a period of two years. The department looks forward to discussing this bill with the council, further determine how best to address stalled sites and the enclosure of such sites. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're going to begin with uh, council member questions. Um, I will uh, open the floor up to my colleagues uh, prior to asking my questions. I'll try to keep my questions focused on 835. Um, but I would like to say that while I share um, a great deal of the desire that HPD has on um, affordable home ownership and have shared, I think, a really good working relationship around that, uh, TPT notwithstanding, um, there's a lot more I feel like we can do. Um, I had a meeting with some of my state colleagues and, and understood that um, even Section 8 and other parts of the state is being used to supplement um, mortgage and home ownership. Um, so those types of things, um, obviously uh, the cost um, in the city um, makes it prohibitive to begin to use that, but there's so many unique um, opportunities and strategies for communities across the city to be able to benefit even in this crisis that we find ourselves in. So I want to stretch to the limit uh, our ability to do this work. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We're happy to look at those options with you. So we're going to begin with Council Member Barron. Uh, I want to thank the chair for the hearing and also for allowing me to get my question in. It's a very short intro. Thank you to the panel for coming. And it's intro number seven. And very briefly, it just says that we would, the council would have a report submitted to it biannually about the number of units that exist in class A, class B, and multiple dwellings. We know how many units are in housing developments, but we don't have any report that indicates to us how many units there are in class A, class B across the city. So um, in the testimony given um, by HPD, I believe you said you support that with amendments. So what amendments would you want to see to that very direct reporting? Yeah, so for example, we currently report on- I'm sorry, could you speak a little louder? Sure, so for example, we currently report on an annual basis. We would want to more align that with our current processes. What would that include? Uh, reporting annually. Just reporting it annually? Yeah, and we want to take a look at the units uh, to make sure that we're getting at what you would like as well. Okay, so you'd have no other objections to the bill. What other agencies would you uh, require to have relationships with in order to make this bill fruitful and productive and effective? Sure, so we work with all agencies uh, who have information on unit counts and also building information. Uh, we also have a very comprehensive data set uh, within our own agency as well. And do you estimate that it would be any f other additional finances related to this bill being imp implemented? Uh, we're still doing cost estimates at this time, but we can get back to you with more information. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the other members of the panel want to comment on the bill, intro seven? I have nothing to add, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, Barry Gudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just very quickly, um, 
the census that you're undertaking uh, based on the new local law, have you seen any results, any patterns, any, you, any insight you can give us? It was a no? No, not yet. <laughs> no, we're, uh, it's too early to tell. We're in year one uh, of this three-year study. And the last time uh, HPD was before us on this matter, um, they really couldn't tell us anything. I was kind of shocked. I was shocked into silence, which my colleagues will tell you doesn't happen very often. But um, it's just so important that we know what's going on. Um, you know, and I think um, a lot of that data can be driven from uh, community boards. Um, it, it's the people in the community always seem to know. They're always a few steps ahead of everybody else. Um, and as I've often tell people, did you know? And I'm like, I didn't know. That's why you have to call me and tell me because I don't drive every block of my district every single day. Um, I could walk them, I guess, but I would I'd weigh a lot less. But um, So that's important. And, and how we get the information, I think, is important. I think it should also be not top down, but I think it should be driven from the community because um, I'm in a district where we have lots and lots of civic associations, very active, um, and they know what's going on before I do. Um, and I get calls about this kind of thing all the time. So I would appreciate you reaching out to uh, the community boards throughout the city um, to make sure that we're getting uh, all the information that we can possibly get, because they're usually, when it comes to this kind of stuff, they are the first responders, generally. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilmember Chin. Um, I have a question in relating to intro um, 226. Um, from your testimony, you said that um, the law that we passed last year and the city is just um, starting to do, uh, to conduct the census. So when the city goes out and inspect property that remain vacant uh, for a long time, what signs do you look for? Or how do you start to identify that that property is vacant? Did somebody call 311? Or how, how do you begin the, the process of, of going out to start inspecting and counting those vacant properties? Is that in relation to the census? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so right now, where we are, we're starting with, um, we, we pulled a handful of relevant agencies together to gather the data they have. We're putting that, um, we are building a model, and then what we're going to do is take uh, through a, a, a rigorous process, pull out a, a sample, and then do visual inspections to see if our model aligns with um, what we're seeing. And then we will come back, we will have conversations with the agencies, we'll have conversations with uh, the council, we'll have conversations with advocates, and then uh, to, to share what we've seen, and then we will uh, alter our model, and then we will go back out and visually inspect. And so that's, that's sort of the process right now. So right now, we're just pulling the data together. When you talk about agency, does the agency include community board? Uh, that, that would, uh, it does not when I refer to agencies, but it can, we can certainly uh, work with community boards. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, like what uh, my colleague, uh, Council Member Gredencha said, I mean, a lot of times the community board are the one that really knows what's going on um, yep. within the district. Um, the other thing with intro 226 is that um, Ms. Mallory, I mean, your testimony, you said that it might, you know, contradict or whatever. I mean, if the law require the owner to register uh, the vacant property, wouldn't that help uh, as another important source uh, of information uh, so that, like, you're working with agency. This way, if we mandate that the, the owners have to register their vacant property, that might be an additional resource in terms of helping to identify where these properties are and would help your, your census count. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. I think that the predictive model that OPS is using for Local Law 29 is really innovative and new and gonna provide a lot more information than the city has had previously to uh, give us more information on policies going forward. We think that more appropriately utilizes our resources um, versus Intro 226, which we think will have a lot of enforcement uh, issues. 
Well, I really wanted to ask you to, to reconsider that and really look forward to more discussion because I think right now it's like, I know you're doing a modeling or whatever, but like talk to the people who are on the ground, <laughs> community board, advocacy organization, council members, like we can really help with that. Absolutely. Uh, to really, because we want to know where these properties are and a lot of them are causing problem in the community where you have a lot of garbage and rats and, and also some site could be used to develop into affordable housing and private owners are holding on to them because they figure they can get a windfall um, or sell it at a very high price and meanwhile they're not taking care of it. So I think pulling together everyone uh, to help that, I think that's really the intention of the bill is to also make the owners accountable. Uh, so that's why we wanna make sure that they're, they're involved in this process also. Correct, and I think you know with Local Law 29 and the data sets that we already have, including those from, for example, our zombie initiatives or a Local Law 4, which requires foreclosure data to be reported to us, that we have uh, really comprehensive data sets and we look forward to coming out with more information on that. Well, we look forward to seeing those. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so I'm gonna go to my questions, uh, trying to focus them around 835, which I believe to be a bill that would give the council members the tools necessary so that they could be um, uh, leaders in their districts as it relates to vacant properties, um, uh, both commercial and residential, uh, community gardens, because as mentioned by my colleagues, we are like literally almost first responders as it relates to anything happening uh, at those sites. Uh, and usually we're the last to know that these sites you know, even even exist. Um, I probably would not have admitted, admitted that I don't drive every district, every street in my district like Barry did, but um, literally, <laughs> but, I mean, so there is information that um, uh, gets reported to us from community boards, from very active civic associations, um, but we need to make sure that we're getting the bulk of the information. So I'll just begin with my questions. Are there particular neighborhoods or areas in the city where there's a concentration of vacant properties? Uh, so right now, uh, we are too early to say in, in our process where those are. I mean, I would defer to um, my colleagues if, if they know through any of the data sets that they have, but uh, that's just not where we are in the process. We're, we're close to getting out there and, and seeing, but we're, we're not there yet. So anecdotally, I would say in highly gentrifying areas like mine. So that's yes. anecdotal, so, but. And HPD has experience working um, with folks and have seen that it's in the neighborhoods that were hit hardest by the foreclosure crisis. Just and what agencies collect information and keep records regarding city-owned vacant properties? So for city-owned, it DCAS that I'm aware of collects that information. Uh, and HPD also holds those within our own jurisdiction and reports on those properties and their planned use through uh, the Local Law 30 report, which is found on our website. So just on DCAS, um, the former um, commissioner for DCAS and I had a long conversation when I first came into the council asking for an assessment of DCAS's properties and kind of demanding um, that those uh, especially the commercial properties when I was the chair of small business, uh, should be below market rate, where the city owned and we own these properties and we were um, making them available at market rate, which I think contributed to, I thought we had a greater responsibility in that area, so I just wanna state that. Um, so we've had our understanding, and I still haven't quite gotten a full assessment. We have a new commissioner and things have changed, but I haven't gotten the assessment of DCAS owned properties in my district is all I asked for at the time, so. On the record, I'd like to get that. Um, on average, how long is a city-owned vacant property kept vacant? So that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I would refer you to DCAS, or I can also follow up with them and try to work. Okay. So in your estimation, if you can, why are these properties vacant? Why, why would a DCAS property be vacant? That's a good question. I would also refer you to, to DCAS for that. Okay. So we understand that the city may be listing tax lots with community gardens and similar community spaces as vacant. In the city's view, what is the literal description of a vacant lot? It's a fantastic question. Um, so every agency defines vacant uh, for their operational concerns. So there's not one 
legal definition of vacant for the city. So this is where we pulled the agencies together and we wanted to, to uh, come together and, and uh, create a starting place for a definition of vacant, which will get refined over time. So at this moment, there's not one, um, but we are working on it. And so just for uh, the listening audience, this is how <laughs> bills ultimately get created yeah. because you hear that and then you say, oh, we should, de we should demand that there be one uniform right. and then someone creates a bill. I'm not gonna do that. I would hope that the agencies would know that themselves and come up with a uniform. The administration should, should do that and not make somebody like me or one of my colleagues come up with a bill to demand that. So I think we, we are working on that through Local Law 29. That is a part of our process under Local Law 29. Okay, thank you. Um, has the city conducted an analysis to determine why certain properties are vacant and what factors contribute to the length of time such properties are kept vacant? I realize that that's another way of asking you the question that I already asked before, but hopefully. Um, so I think part of the process of Local Law 29 will be taking in that information and utilizing it for public policy reasons. Currently, we have um, at HPD different data sets and factors where we meet with community members or do surveys, for example, through our Zombie Homes Initiative, have reporting done to us as an agency in order to take that information in and look at the wide range of reasons that can impact or create a vacancy status. And that depends on a wide range of things, especially by size of building or type of building. So we're always looking at that with those data sets in mind. So, so for me, in particular as the chair and someone who has two and a half years left on his term and who's struggling with local 29, local 29 to get my needs met as a local council member, which is why we have you know, parsed out some of these bills for expediency, if nothing else. So. Absolutely, and council member, the one thing that I do wanna say is the zombie initiative that we have worked on is from a state zombie uh, law for foreclosure prevention and data collection. And you, all council members, it's confidential, so we can't report that information out, but council members can contact DFS in order to Department of Financial Services at the state to get that information for their council district. So we're happy to provide that email so you can request that information from the state. So I, while I don't mind doing that, um, we just feel like we have a responsibility here on the city to work directly with our administration to get those uh, numbers, which is, partly why my bill was created. But how many city-owned vacant lots and vacant buildings are there? Uh, so again, I would refer you to, to DCAS. Okay, so I'm going to, on the record, say that my next question to DCAS will be how, uh, can they break down the information for us by borough, which I already know the answer to, which is why my bill is in place. So um, we've been joined by um, Council Member Rivera. Do you have any questions? So we'll go back to Councilmember Chin, who I believe has another question. I mean, since today we're hearing bills about you know vacant lots and city-owned lots, if the administration had represented it here, DCAS should have been here to answer those questions, um, because they're the one that runs all the city-owned properties. So they they should have been here. Um, relating to Intro uh, 1128. Uh, with this, all these uh, stall construction sites. Does Department of Building have a count of how many construction sites are stalled and also break down by community board district or council district? Good morning. To, yeah. to a certain extent, we do. Um, uh, following the 2008 recession, uh, Local Law 70 of two, 2009 was enacted, which established a stalled sites program. Following the recession, there were a number of construction sites throughout the city that had halted, in large measure due to lack of the ability to secure fa financing. So a stalled sites program was enacted, ensuring that those sites that are stalled are maintained safe, while at the same time ensuring that once financing was secured, the means was created to have work start on those sites again as quickly as possible. At that point in time, there was something north of 400 sites that were included in that stalled sites program. The law provided that that program sunset in 2013. So in 2013, that program um, 
no longer existed, in large measure because there was no longer a recession, the economy came back, there wasn't a need to have this stalled sites program any longer. However, of those sites that were initially part of the program, the department has continued to keep track of those sites. And to date, of those north of 400 sites that were a part of that program, there are now 45 sites left um, within that program. And I can provide you the breakdown throughout the boroughs if you'd like. There are 14 in Manhattan, six in the Bronx, one in Brooklyn, three in Queens, and 21 in Staten Island. But that would be the extent of the, the department's tracking of stalled sites throughout the city. But are there new sites, new stalled sites that the department is tracking? Presumably there are, but the department, as a matter of practice, does not keep track of those sites. Why not? What would happen is if someone calls 301 to file a complaint about a stalled site, let's say, the department sees vacancy, I guess you can say, through the lens of safety, entirely through safety. So we would show up to perform an inspection to determine whether or not the building is structurally sound, if it's properly sealed, and if any of those conditions exist, we would issue what's called an unsafe buildings violation to require the owner to take steps to make that building safe or to seal the building. So we do have, a re we can provide you with a number of unsafe building violations that we've issued based on complaints that we received. And last year the department issued 245 unsafe building violations. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, that the building was vacant. It could be it's structurally unsound, it could also be that it wasn't properly sealed. Chances are those buildings are vacant, though. The, so in your interagency discussion, would that information go into your database or whatever as vacant property? Correct. As part of our data sharing relationship that we're building, this is just only, as I understand it, a small piece of a larger subset of information that's being shared across a dozen or so agencies with the mayor's office to create their model. And also with HPD, now, if there are stall sites, does HPD take a look at some of these to see if there's opportunity for HPD to, to step in and see if possibility of developing affordable housing or? Absolutely. So we do look at um, opportunities for affordable housing whenever possible, and if they're brought to our attention, uh, there are instances where we've gone out and reached out to owners to see if they're interested uh, in sharing or getting a selling their property or working with HPD in order to develop on that site. But in your interagency sharing information, I'm saying that not that an owner come forward to you, but in your meeting, if you see that there are stall sites that are vacant, does HPD proactively go out and talk to the owner or do research to see if that might be a potential opportunity for developing affordable housing. Yes, yeah, so that information doesn't just come from owners, but comes from our partner agencies, community boards, council members as well. Okay, I, I just hope that that discussions are happening uh, because that would be a great opportunity to, to look at developing more affordable housing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm curious, is, are the location of vacant lots and or properties generated primarily by 311 complaints? Uh, so it depends. I wouldn't say necessarily primarily. I think there are lots of different places in which they are incoming to different agencies. Yeah, I think there are only uh, a couple of ways that, that uh, we are getting through in one data, but it's, it's primarily through, um, I believe, DSNY, so they, they come up as service requests. Um, and so they are, it's primarily DSNY for uh, cleanliness and uh, DOB for safety. So just walk me through it uh, as a novice. Someone calls 311 to complain of excessive garbage or rodents or something to that nature. DSMY then disseminates that information to who? 311 uh, sends it over to DSNY and DSNY goes out and, and inspects. I, I and then who does DSNY tell the results of their inspection? Uh, that's a good question. They may have an internal system. I'm, I'm not sure. But then we are collecting that data. As from far from as where? from what uh, they, they must have uh, an internal database, you know? Yeah, they have an internal database where they, the inspectors go out, uh, they put the findings in, um, and then we are adding that to our, to our database, to our data set. So I, 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 
I don't, I hate the adage beating a dead horse, but I don't want, I don't understand. So once DSNY report, they put it in their database, mm -hmm. then you go in to the database or the, who forwards from, and who forwards DSNY's findings? Like how do you, how do you so guys know that, that, that it's a, so I'm assuming that someone makes a call, they go out, realize that the property is vacant, that's why there's an excessive sanitation issue, and then what happens? Yeah, so it's not, it's not exactly like a, it's not like a, a, a live feed. We're collecting uh, data from them, um, like raw data from them, but not on like a streaming basis. It's not coming in. Uh, this is, again, just, I don't know if, sorry, give me one second. Sorry, somebody can tell you a little bit more mm -hmm. detail about the, the Thank process you. than I. Hi, I'm Dan Steinberg from Operations. Uh, we're building the model now. So the, the idea is that it's going to be one of the inputs and, and we want to create a feed that says in, you know, in real time as the, um, as the technology allows for. But right now, um, but yes, so through 311 data, the, the two big indicators are uh, lock cleanings from sanitation and uh, building safety issues that DOB um, addresses. And those are two key data inputs that will feed the model. Be, so assigned, a pro be assigned sort of a weight um, that suggests whether or not the-, the uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being yeah. told I have to actually uh, affirm your- Oh. Your, oh. your right hand, Dad. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth and testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? I do. Great. Now I have and, to change and that my goes answer. For, no, that goes for, <laughs> <laughs> for everything you said prior. Yes. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, the, sorry. The, the system is being designed mm -hmm. to accept that information right. uh, when it comes, that data set when it comes exactly. in. Exactly. There'll be more than 10 d data sets all feeding this one system. And then the system is going to generate a, essentially a confidence score as to the status of that lot based on, on these inputs. And some of the inputs are more valuable than others in terms of as, you know, serving as an indicator. So right. is there an ETA on a build out? Of of the site, of the 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 model that we're building. Yes. Uh, I mean, we're right now we're sort of doing it very deliberately with the time that we have. Um, the idea, in, in terms of our schedule, um, the idea is to have a full kind of build out of the model, um, so we can dispatch the the um, inspectors. Uh, and, and, and this this particular what we're talking about right now is a, a function of local 29. I mean, well, the, local this local is the way that we're operationalizing local law 29. This is the way that we're. So I don't remember whether or not we had an end time that we were expecting as a as a council or especially as a housing and buildings committee. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to rely on you under testimony to, to, to kind of give me what the framework would be because, like I said, I got I got two and a half years left if I'm lucky. Right. And um, I, I would really expect for this system to be built out and me to be benefiting from it in my district before, I, before the next council member comes on. I think we would like to do it uh, also. Yeah. I, I just can't. I, I can't, would, I would yeah. wow, I would like that too. Right. <laughs> but I'm hoping that we could get a more definitive answer. If not today, I really would like as the, as the chair. So we have every get, intention of, we have, the local law 29 gives us three years. That's the first phase to have the where, where are we within the three years? Well, year one. So we got two years left. We do, but we are, we are, I can say affirmatively, we are not gonna run over. Uh, we're working, uh, you know, deliberately to, to move along as fast as we can. Um, so, you know, we'll communicate with you along the way. I, I just wanna add one thing it, it, to a question you asked before. The, the very purpose of why we wanna engage both the council and the advocates are to refine these, these visual markers that, that we intend to use. And, and um, the advocates have a ton of experience going out there and, and assessing properties because they've been the ones leading this effort up till now. And so we really want to sort of learn from their experience and but also talk to you because you do know your districts. So from an operations standpoint, um, my colleagues mentioned uh, the use of civic uh, organizations, the use of um, community boards, and obviously the use of council members' offices. Yep. Yes. Uh, is that something that you're counting on? Absolutely. As, as Absolutely. This is it's only one part of the, the, the data modeling is only one part of our process, right? right? Once we finish with the data modeling and the next, like, uh, you know, the first round of data modeling, 
uh, should come up soon, and I, I mentioned this in my testimony. The next thing that we're gonna do is have conversations uh, after we send out the inspectors to visually inspect the uh, sample of the sites, is to then engage council members, uh, community boards, and, and advocates. That's, it's in the testimony that's part of our plan. We, we put a real premium on local knowledge with Absolutely. this initiative, Absolutely. because th this whole uh, initiative is sort of about um, the, the, you know, the historic inability to have real command over this sort of um, set of properties. And so we really do want to partner in, in earnest. Uh, Thank you. So we've been joined by Council Member Torres and also Council Member Jonai. Um, Thanks. Okay. If there's, if there's no more questions, we are going to thank you very much for your testimony and look for a very robust follow-up. With all of you, you can expect to get a call from our office uh, trying to follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Delar, I'm sorry, we're going to call the next panel, which is uh, Delar De Jesus, Leo Goldberg, Paula Siegel, uh, Scott, I'm sorry, I can't see the last name, uh, and John Krinsky. We ask to put uh, two minutes on the clock for uh, public testimony. Once you're settled, you can begin your testimony as soon as you're ready. And this, you can start wherever you like. All right, good morning. My name is Pilar de Jesus. Um, I am an advocate with the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center, but I'm also the president of East Harlem Preservation. I was hoping that HPD would stay. Um, so in, I also uh, live there, in- there, there are members from oh, okay. HPD here. Great. Um, I live in East Harlem, which is one of the areas that have been rezoned and been through a lot of gentrification. I've lived there for 38 years of my life. Um, and I'm really interested, I was really interested in hearing how HPD did, said that they don't, they're not aware of where these buildings, these vacant properties are. I've been living in my community for 38 years, as I mentioned, and the same Ross portfolio, I believe it is, that's been vacant for 40 years. We have, I could take you on a tour, and I really want, I'm really serious about that. I'm willing to give you guys a tour of all the vacant properties in my district, which is Ayala's district, and I'm, I'm not sure what her, where she stands with this, but I'm assuming she supports this because we have tons and tons of vacant property. And it's really sad because as we all know, we have this serious housing crisis going on. Tenants are being displaced. We got what, 65,000 homeless people. These are properties that could be used to house people and it would be low income housing. It would be, it's rent regulated buildings, most of them, they're, they're vacant. And I, I don't understand why they've been vacant for so long, they're just sitting there. And these are the same landlords that claim they're broke, I don't know, you know. So HPD, I think that I would encourage that you work with organizations like mine, other community-based um, community organizations. Yeah, work with the community boards, but your community-based organizations are going to have that information because they are on the ground. They know, they're talking to the tenants. They're, they're there, we're there. And so, um, yeah, I support the 226 and 835 because yeah, it's a real serious problem with these landlords. So, Mr. Jesus, I want to thank you. What was the name of your organization again? Um, East Harlem Preservation. So, if you heard, the last question I asked was, did they commit to having the voices of uh, local nonprofits, community boards, and their council members, and they said yes on the record. So, so yeah, let's go. Gonna, I'm going to give you my information that. now. I'm willing to, to do it this weekend. 
Thank for you. Today. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. Good My name is Leo Goldberg. I'm policy and research manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Thank you, Chair Carnegie and uh, members of the committee for holding this hearing. Um, I have submitted more extensive testimony. Uh, we support these bills and want to take the opportunity um, to point to the fact that these are focused on enforcement and data reporting, and that there's also a real need for funding and capacity building to act on interventions that are illuminated by this data. Um, so I'll point to a few examples of that. Uh, one is that foreclosure prevention uh, is one of the most effective ways to make sure that vacant and abandoned properties don't exist in the first place. Many of these properties, uh, especially in lower rise neighborhoods, are the product of uh, foreclosure uh, process. They could be zombie properties or bank owned or um, otherwise. And uh, the city's foreclosure prevention services through housing counseling and pro bono legal services are primarily funded um, through attorney general settlement funds which are expiring in March. So there's a state coalition called Communities First um, asking that funding is put into the state budget um, to continue these legal services for foreclosure prevention. Without them, we'll lose a huge amount of our capacity to help uh, homeowners and prevent these vacant and abandoned properties. So uh, we're hoping that uh, the city council will support our ask to the state legislature to get that funding in the state budget. Um, what, was, what was the number? The, uh, $20 million is what it's been funded at uh, for the last several years. So that's what the Community First campaign is looking to get into the budget. Thank you. Um, another. Uh, uh, thing that we'd like to point to here is that uh, there are ways to bring these vacant and abandoned properties into public or community ownership so that they can be used for affordable housing. And um, we, HBD spoke to some of the mechanisms they have in place, um, and we support community land trusts and code enforcement acquisition programs, other ways to make sure that these lots uh, can provide permanent affordable homes for people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, before the next testimony, I'd like to allow my uh, colleague uh, Councilmember Holden to read uh, to to say a few words about his bills. Um, yes, um, on, uh, I'm sorry, I was at another hearing. So um, uh, on, on intro 1124, the padlock bill, um, we you know it's a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to orders to secure and seal and close. The bill requires the Department of Buildings Commissioner to commence proceedings to seal, secure, and Close a property where $25,000 or more of unpaid fines is, fines is owed to the city with respect to the property. The property must also be vacant. Uh, it would address uh, potential squatting, illicit drug activity, um, road and vermin concerns, and, um, and often many derelict zombie homes, which we call them, are attached, and especially in my, many of my uh, areas of my district, they're attached row houses. Uh, we had one that had the um, person was put in into a, a facility uh, and a, a, a window was left open, a bathroom window, and uh, pigeons, vermin, everything got in there for years. And we finally um, were able to seal it, but it was an ordeal. Uh, 1125 uh, is a bill that require a HPD uh, to report foreclosure data to each council member, because. This is very important that we, sometimes we obviously have uh, foreclosures and we don't realize it. We can step in. The council member could do something about that so, uh, and suggest uh, you know, alternative uh, purposes for the, uh, the, the facility, the home. Uh, also, we can keep an eye on this, um, th this property. Um, and so these, these are on, in, in many districts all over the city. Um, so that is certainly, uh, I think, a bill that's worth considering. Um, and, and last, the uh, Construction Fences Act, which I have um, in my district um, sort of stalled sites, construction sites that are left for decades with construction fence, uh, fences, the, the, uh, they call them the green fences, um, that are covered with graffiti. So this bill, after, if, so the, if the stalled site is left for two years, um, 
uh, then um, the wooden fence would have to be replaced with a chain link fence, which is a little better looking, obviously. And you could, some of the concerns we've seen from some of the construction companies, well, uh, somebody can climb a construction, I mean, um, a chain link fence. However, there are chain link fences with smaller um, openings where you couldn't put your foot in and get over. So, uh, and it would eliminate some of the graffiti, obviously, that we have on the wooden fences. But again, I have multiple sites, and I think all around the city we have them, that are just st stalled for decades. You know, so what happens, some of the um, builders will put the foundation in to grandfather any zoning changes in the area and then leave it for, again, many, many years. So this after two years, we'd have at least a, a better looking uh, site uh, and facility. And plus, many of the offenses that we see, like I mentioned, covered with graffiti and in poor condition. Like they, in any kind of windstorm, they fall down. So this would make a, a, is, is a safety uh, concern for everyone. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. We can continue with the testimony. My name is Scott Andrew Hutchins, and I've been a member of Picture the Homeless for the past six years. May 25th, 2019 will be the seventh anniversary of my entry into the shelter system. I was quoted in an October 31st, 2014 article by Yadi Osorio in Liberation News titled, Most Expensive Homes in New York City Empty, saying, if you want to have pied -a terre okay, that's your business, but it shouldn't be done off the backs of others. There should be a tax on these homes. My position has not changed. Basic Civic says that your rights stop when another's begins. When your demand for expensive housing pushes record numbers of people into homelessness, your right to private property is secondary. Any right to make money from real estate is secondary to making sure that housing is available at every income level. I also stated in the article that what should be done with the money taken in those taxes, the money should be given to community land trusts. In the meantime, the city can work on finding real homes for individuals, stable housing. That's what we need. Intro 226 is a major step in eliminating the tale of two cities that de Blasio pointed out, but so far has done little or nothing to alleviate after five years in office. Even were it not for the fees and fines serving the purposes of taxation that I previously detailed, the registry of vacant property is of immense use to the city. It would create a ready pool of information about vacant properties. Information has been sorely needed for a long time and researched piecemeal by organizations such as Picture the Homeless in its 2012 foot count of vacant property reported in Banking on Vacancy. Yadi Osorio's article also uh, quotes from an article in The Real Deal which states that the Census Bureau's 2012 American Community Survey reveals that 285 of 496 apartments or 57% in a three-block stretch of Midtown from East 56th Street to East 59th Street between Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue are vacant at least 10 months a year. The number drops to the lower but still staggeringly high 30% when that range is expanded to 44th through 70th Streets. Homelessness is up to about 63,700 people as of November, and as my individual case demonstrates, it is primarily up to the hiring and payroll whims of those with wealth as to whether one can afford housing. There needs to be a price for pricing people out, and that price should be high enough to be a deterrent. We do not really have a crisis of homelessness in New York City. We have a crisis of greed. The housing is available, and the fact that so many are kept out is a public health crisis. Opponents are probably terrified that such a registry will lead to the use of eminent domain to house the homeless. As someone for whom higher education does not get me job interviews, I would welcome such a development and hope the city council sees the justice that that entails. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Paula Siegel. I'm here today as senior staff attorney at the Community Development Project. We are a nonprofit legal services organization that works with grassroots and community-based groups in New York City to dismantle racial, economic, and social oppression. My practice particularly works directly with impacted communities to respond to city planning processes and lacks, lack of processes. Um, that have left communities behind as so much of the city has improved from the bad old days of the 1970s, which most of us don't remember, yet we have to hear about in policy discussions all the time. Um, so we heard about the administration, administration's efforts to create a data model to drive a census of vacant properties. We also heard from them that they didn't have a definition that they were working with, a vacancy to drive their data model. That's interesting, I commend them. They have a serious challenge before them. As some of you know on the committee, I've spent 
about five years working with the city's data about vacant properties, and it's confusing. The data's bad. Their project is hard. Good luck to them, and I'm glad that they have three years to do it. But doing that modeling is not nearly enough. That model, it relies on reporting from sanitation garages. It relies on connecting a system of agencies that don't talk to each other. And what it's missing is a key set of actors that influence what happens with properties in our neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods that experience redlining and disinvestment, and those are the places that are now being gentrified and where vacant properties are, are concentrated. That's the owners. We have done nothing so far to actually target the owners. Intro 226 will put responsibility where it needs to be. So I commend the council, and please let us know how we can help you get this bill passed. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for your continued efforts on the ground. Good morning, uh, Committee Chair Carnegie um, and members of the Housing Buildings Committee. My name is John Krinsky, and I'm a professor of political science at City College and the CUNY Grad Center. I'm also a co-founder and board member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, a coalition of more than two dozen housing and social justice organizations that advocates for the use of community land trusts to preserve and create deeply affordable housing in stabilized neighborhoods, and on behalf of which I offer my testimony this morning. Since its founding in uh, 2012, the New York City Community Land Initiative has worked along at, alongside its co-founder and partner, Picture the Homeless, to promote responsible property ownership in New York City and specifically to address the problem of warehousing and speculation in the midst of the most acute homelessness crisis the city has ever faced. In December 2017, the City Council passed the Housing Not Warehousing Act, which among other things requires the city to keep account uh, and inventory of vacant property, both publicly and privately owned. Uh, the act was devised and advocated for by Picture the Homeless for 10 years based on its path-breaking work documenting vacancies in warehousing in its 2012 report, Banking on Vacancy, which uh, Scott uh, mentioned, and also earlier pilot studies going back to 2006. There are therefore groups in the room with on-the-ground experience counting vacancies. Statistical models may be of use, but as a professor, I can say that any good research should build on what's already been done. The Warehousing Accountability Act, or uh, uh, Intro 226, puts teeth in the Housing Not Warehousing Act by requiring property owners who have kept their property vacant for more than a year to register the property with the city and to pay significant fines if they do not. Uh, this would ease the burden on the city of conducting a census of vacancies, as has uh, been uh, mentioned by Council Member Chen. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, close by saying uh, that uh, Nicely believes that this is a fair and reasonable addition to the important work that the Council has already been doing to secure responsible property ownership in the city. I personally would like to thank you all for your testimony and the hard work that you do on the ground on behalf of uh, citizens, in, uh, in particular people who are finding it difficult to remain domiciled in a city that's changing so quickly. So thank you again. Thank you. Uh, housing and Buildings hearing today is adjourned.